The agenda this week examined federal budget measures aimed at helping first-time home buyers and, first up in the Agenda's Week in Review, retraining incentives to help build a flexible and highly skilled workforce. Encouraging young people to explore what their options are as early as possible, but also connecting that to opportunities to experience some of those options are two things that we're missing in our, in our ecosystem right now when it comes to skills development and workforce development. Um, and then there's the other issue of we're talking a lot about students, but we have an incredible number of young people who are not in school. And, um, but we would like to encourage them to return at some point should it make sense for them, whether it's college, university, uh, some sort of technical training, and there are some, some investments that are being made to support those individuals. But it's, it's, a, it's a major issue. We are missing opportunities to encourage early exploration, but also the opportunity to step into different types of workplaces to experience some of these new and emerging industries. Stephen, can I get you to comment on that, the notion that maybe even in elementary school, it's time to start talking careers with kids? Yeah, well, I think that that's a reality, but I think that what we mean by careers is very different. So when we were in school, the notion of talking to a middle school child about a career is daunting. But really what we're saying is trying to get them thinking about what they're passionate about mm -hmm. early on in life. Because the reality is that my students who are graduating today will have seven to 12 to 15 gigs, as we call them, right? Uh, that's a very different career landscape from what we might have graduated into. So the notion that you're not going to be able to pivot is, is not a real one. You are going to be able to pivot and change and, and move and you're going to be expected to. So having some initial mm -hmm. passion, I think, is the real key. And then taking that passion and saying, where am I evolving to in my career? And, and how do I need to upskill myself as a matter of course? And I think as a country, that's a big thing we have to grapple with it. You don't <clears> just <throat> finish your degree and then think that you're educated for the rest of your career. And we've got to get over this notion that I know Canadians don't like lifelong learning. And and the Honourable Patty Haidu was at our campus just yesterday talking about skills training. Their data shows the same thing, that our, our adults don't like the term lifelong learning. So whatever we have to do, we have to make it less scary for adults to come back. And universities are, we're very guilty of, you know, bringing people back to a zone that might not feel as comfortable as it needs to. So bringing people back with uh, their colleagues, so they're in a class with others and not feeling like, am I gonna flunk out of my test? Are they gonna figure out how that I'm not quite smart enough? We have to deal with those fears in order to, I think, have a systemic uh, approach to skills training that's gonna take us well into this century in terms of the needs we see in so many of our industries. Well, apropos of that, the federal budget came out not too long ago, and Sunil and uh, Mike, maybe I can get you to start with some reaction to that. Uh, lots of skills training measures in the federal budget. Canada training tax, ben uh, excuse me, Canada training benefit tax credit, giving Canadians 250 bucks a year for training, up to 5,000. EI training support benefit, which would give employees up to four weeks off for training. These are all new measures. How useful do you expect them to be? I think they're a good start. I mean, the challenge we've got right now in Canada is that from a public sector perspective, we don't fund skills training nearly to the level that other advanced economies do. Uh, the level of coverage is patchy. So a lot of people who aren't eligible for employment insurance, for example, aren't eligible for public skills training. Uh, and the quality of the programs that people have access to is also quite hidden. Uh, miss. I mean, those are challenges. So introducing programs like the ones in the budget last week, uh, I think are a good step because what they essentially do is they uh, provide that autonomy to individual learners and say, okay, if, if you feel you need to take a course, here's some money that's going to help you defray the costs of taking that course. Uh, and you're also going to have EI support uh, during the time that you're off work mm. uh, taking the course. So you're not at risk of losing your job. Right. Uh, either. So I mean, this is modeled, I think, on the, what Singapore has been doing over the past three or four years. They have a skills future program, which is very similar uh, to this. But again, it's just a start. I mean, $5,000 over, over your life course is not a lot of <clears> money. I mean, yeah. uh, an MBA at U of T costs 90 some thousand dollars. So I mean- 5,000 is not going to take you very far. That's going to cover a couple of textbooks, right. basically. But Michael, yeah, follow up. Well, I just just uh, to go back to what Stephen's saying a little bit about this, this seeking passion out in people, um, you know, and then to go to the dollars. The dollars are, are great. I, I think anyone who takes away the fact that someone's going to solve this problem for you as an individual is taking the wrong message. If there's an expectation I will be paid to relearn and, and what have you, that, that just seems like a very dangerous future for us. What I believe in is... Um, 
setting the expectation that the new world order is continuous learning. Uh, one of the things we've done at FreshBooks, we're a very values-driven organization. We actually have a value around passion. The word doesn't matter, definition does, which is we're continuously working on our craft, and if we weren't doing it here, we'd be doing it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wanna hire people, the reason I wanna hire them and they have passion is because they're gonna have the energy to keep learning. I can't pay you to learn, and that's what the government, I hate to say, is kind of trying to do right now. I think there's young people across the country that are doing some math right now, maybe along with their parents or along with their financial advisors. Uh, up until this recent budget, they may have felt entirely priced out of the market, and the math is being done by individuals absolutely not in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, but there are a lot of millennials that in, in smaller communities in our country that have felt absolutely um, excluded in a way from, from the housing market. And I actually think it's, it's had um, an impact on, on one's degree of optimism about their future. So there are going to be individuals across the country that are now going to be looking at, is this going to put me over the edge? Is it going to make it possible? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are going to be people for whom it makes the difference. You know, back in the day it was, uh, I remember when I bought my first house, uh, my first condo, my, my dad kicked in a $25,000 loan. Now, granted, it was interest-bearing, their good old dad, <laughs> but nonetheless, it, it actually made it possible. And not every young couple in Canada have parents that can kind of kick in a little bit like that. Can I ask you, on behalf of dads everywhere, yeah. did you pay them back? Absolutely. With Ahead of time, Ahead of by time. the good way. Good for you. So, good for you. Well done. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what difference it would make. I have a concern, though. And my concern is that it may not be the best deal to make for these people. It may not be, it, it may not be in the interest of the people that this was designed for. Yeah. Okay, we'd better follow up on that right now. What do you mean? Well, if you do the math and you... Because what I think will happen is it will actually allow somebody potentially to just buy a house that's 20000 or 30000 more than they otherwise would buy. When people prepare for buying a house or a condo, what they do first is they gather up all the nuts that they have. They say, where's all the resources? Mm -hmm. The cash, the savings, the RSP, et cetera. And they come to us and they say, okay, how much can I afford? You know, well, where does that leave me as far as a mortgage? And therefore, how much of a, of a piece of real estate can I buy? So, so now we have this extra piece in the, in, in, in the uh, you got calculation. Nut in your basket. You got another one. So, so the house that's being chosen is, is inclusive of that money. However, you know, the piper will be paid down the line. And if that home is going to be owned for 20 or 30 years, and when you ultimately sell it, you're going to have to give 5 or 10% of that appreciated value back to the government. Um, that, that's going to have a long term impact that I think there will be this moment of, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. Interesting. You know? mm -hmm. Let's just, uh, apropos of what you just said, figure out who this program was sort of aimed at. Sheldon, bring the next graphic up if you would. This is from CMHC, Canon Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Nearly half the people uh, who are first time home buyers are so called millennials. That's the ages of 25 to 34. Four in 10 are married. Six out of 10 purchased a single detached home. And about a quarter have a household income of $60,000 to $90,000. That's your typical demographic of a typical first-time home buyer. Now, following up on what uh, Rona just said, Craig, d d is there a part of you that is concerned that this program, while designed to help this target demographic get into the housing market, may actually end up hurting it? Well, I think part of the challenge the government had is, you know, they're hearing that housing affordability is a concern, but any policies that really increase demand for housing would actually push up prices. And we've seen that in, in other policies. So what they're trying to do is, is limit the impact on the overall market by targeting the people you might be most concerned about. And that would be the young, you know, the young millennial buyer that's having a difficulty getting into the market because prices have gone up so much in recent years. Um, the challenge, which came, came up a bit earlier, is that if you actually look at it from a point of view of housing comp composition, you know, this, this, this policy might help some young buyers trying to buy a below average price condo in Toronto. But in point of fact, the, the average price of a condo in Toronto is higher than the 480000 When you leave Toronto, all of a sudden it's like, yes, this will help buyers of, of like apartments, apartment condos uh, uh, throughout the rest of Ontario. But when you look at townhouses, you then suddenly find that in some of the markets, townhouses 
uh, are too high a price in order to, to access the program. And, and when we say it, it's good for up to 480,000, it's, it's actually four times the income of the household. So mm. if, 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 if mm. your household income is 100,000, the maximum you can buy is 400,000, and if so on down, down, down the scale. And that is the agenda's week in review for this Friday, March 29th, 2019. You can see all of those conversations and more at TVO.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, and on our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.